you'll know a guy who only occasionally shaves for big occasions, and it's because that occasional shave really hurts. It's the time of year for big occasions, and yet there he is, suffering with that cheap drugstore razor. Let's help him out. Henson Shaving's line of razors, built with aerospace precision, deliver a smooth shave your dad, brother, and even son can enjoy, eventually. With replacement blades just 10 cents each, you'll buy it once, and they'll use it for life. How's that for the perfect gift? Celebrate with 100 free blades on your first purchase, and no subscription headaches. HensonShaving.com slash holiday. If your child is considering something as big as joining the military, you can bet they're taking the time to do some research. You can too by visiting todaysmilitary.com because their success tomorrow begins with your support today. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Many of us in our work reach out for the unknown. A scientist involved in research is sometimes astounded by the results of his experiments. They turn out in ways he would never have predicted. Likewise, a detective looking for clues in an unsolved crime must be prepared for any development, even the most unexpected. These, Lieutenant, are the people whose backgrounds our organization was asked to investigate. The names of the four murdered men are all on this list. Yes, it would appear, then, that the person who requested us to investigate is behind the kiddings. Uh, do you have his name? Uh, yeah, it is uh, right here. Hey, there must be some mistake. This name isn't possible. I can assure you that this is the person. Why? Do you know him? <laughs> Our mystery drama, Delusion of Reprieve, was written especially for Mystery Theater by Percy Granger and stars Paul Hecht. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Detective deals in that most elusive of all areas, human motivation. How easy it can be to conceal the desires that motivate us. To tell a lie, to cover up our true thoughts and feelings, to hide, in fact, who we really are. And how difficult that can make the detective's job of ferreting out criminals. We're in the locker room of a police station in a suburb of a large industrial city. Hey, good morning, Lieutenant Bernstein. Welcome back. Hey, Peter, thank you. How, uh, how is your father now? Well, the operation was a success, but his heart is still weak. You look pretty tired. Yeah, I was at his bedside the whole time. The doctor said it was only my being there that kept Dad's morale up. Oh, wasn't, wasn't your mother there? Uh... No, she's, uh, she's been dead for many years, Peter. She died bef before we left Europe during the war. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, how have you been? Oh, my arthritis keeps getting worse. Makes it harder all the time to tend to my custodial duties around the station house. Well, haven't you ever thought about retiring? Oh, what good would that do? Now I've got my arthritis and my job. If I retired, I'd just have my arthritis. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, Captain Nolan in yet? Oh, yeah, he's already in his office. And any action around the precinct while I was gone? Oh, he didn't hear. Oh, no, I haven't seen a newspaper since I left. There's been another murder. Two days ago. Another one? Like the others? Well, seems to be. But uh, judging from the expression on Captain Nolan's face, there, there still aren't any real leads. Yeah, well, excuse me, Peter, I... Uh... I'd better get down to his office. Captain, the lab reports just came in on that latest murder. Oh, thanks, Florence. Mm -hmm. Mike said he'd be back today. Have you seen him yet? I think he's in the locker room. Uh -huh. Hello, Tony. Oh, hiya, Florence. Well, speak of the devil. Mike, 
Uh, how's your father? Well, it's still touch and go, but uh, he's okay for now. Hmm. Did you hear we've been visited by the phantom murderer again? Yeah, Peter Fleming told me. If you gentlemen will excuse me, I'd better get back to the front desk. I'm glad you're back, Mike. Thanks, Flo. Well, what's the story on this one, Tony? Well, the guy's name was Thomas Heinrich. Florence just brought in the lab reports. Anything that links this killing to the others? Same method. Shot from the front at close range. Yeah, like the killer might have known him. Or wanted to confront him for some reason before pulling the trigger. Yeah. What does ballistics say? Well, the bullet that killed Heinrich came from the same kind of semi-automatic pistol that was used on the others. Four murders in less than two months in a town that normally has one or two murders a year top. Yeah, but well, what's behind it? These four men had nothing in common. They didn't even know each other, so far as we can tell. Now, the FBI has checked for possible interstate activity, mob connections. Nothing comes up. Yeah, I don't suppose Heinrich was robbed. No, neither were the others. Well, it is possible that the murderer is picking victims at random. Yes, but not likely. Mass killers generally follow one or two patterns. Either they hold themselves up somewhere and start blasting away at everything that moves... Or they choose their victims because of something they all have in common and kill them one at a time over a period of months or even years. You know, following that prescription, we seem to have a representative of the second variety on their hands. Yeah, but what is the link? Three of the victims were married. One wasn't. Two owned their own small businesses. The other two worked in factories. Now, if the murderer is picking his victims at random... It means we're helpless until he makes a mistake. And what was Heinrich's profile? Hmm? Oh, here, look for yourself. Yeah. He uh, seems to have led a simple enough life. A hard-working, middle-class guy. Owned his own paint store. Nothing out of the ordinary. Yeah, it says here he was a naturalized citizen. Oh, yeah. Uh, he and his wife immigrated here from Germany. Weren't the other three victims also immigrants? Mike, that profile fits 80% of the people in this town. Well, your own father was an immigrant. Hey, hey, look. Look, here's something else. Huh? Heinrich had a police record. Yeah, all that. Uh, yeah, he was booked once for a brawl in a bar over on the south side. I checked it out. It was, uh, let's see, 15 years ago. The bar isn't even there anymore. Well, it is interesting, though. Well, why? As I recall, the others all had police records, too. Well, they'd all been arrested once on various minor charges, so what? I've already considered that possibility. Heinrich was arrested in 1963 for brawling. Shulman was arrested in 1958 and Blotz in 1972, both for drunken driving. Let's see, the first victim, Gregor Vysinski, was booked in 1958 in connection with some labor dispute at the factory where he worked. That's a 14-year spread and the offenses are totally unrelated. What can you possibly make out of that? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing yet, anyway. But anything these men had in common ought to be kept in mind. Obviously, we're up against a very clever person. I don't know, Tony. I, I almost think the guy's a lucky amateur. Why? He hasn't left a single clue, and there's yet to be a single witness. Uh, we're, we're looking for patterns, right? Well, we'll look at this one. The first murder was two months ago. Then for four weeks, nothing. Then the second murder. And this time, in less than two weeks, the third, and a week later, the fourth. It's almost as if he were gathering courage. But what is it this guy's after? What's driving him to kill? He doesn't like immigrants from Central Europe? Oh, terrific. There are 40,000 of them in this town. Is he planning to kill them all? Yeah. Have you interrogated uh, Heinrich's widow yet? No. Get your hat. That's where we're going now. Yeah? Who is it? I'm Mrs. Heinrich. It's Captain Nolan from the police department. Oh, yeah. I have been waiting for you. Come in. Yeah, uh, this is uh, my associate, Lieutenant Bernstein. Bernstein? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about your husband, Mrs. Heinrich. Oh, well, please, have a seat. Thank you. That shouldn't take long. Would you like some coffee? No, no, thank no. you. Well, we just like to ask a few questions, and then we'll go. Oh, please, ask as many as you like. Oh, can I get you a more comfortable chair? Uh, Mrs. Hendrick. I'm sorry. Forgive me. But since Thomas died, I have felt I must keep busy. I am afraid to stop. Yeah, we understand. Now, first of all, is there anyone you can think of who, well, might have had a reason to kill your husband? Oh, that is a question I have asked myself a hundred times. And every time, the answer is no. I can think of no one. Did he have any outstanding debts? None. Our mortgage insurance policies, they're all paid up. Everything we own is paid for. Mm. We were certain that he owed money to no one. I was the bookkeeper for our household and the store captain. 
No, I am certain. Uh, Miss Heinrich, uh, did your husband have any habits? Habits? I mean, did he play the horses? Did he gamble in any way? Well, he bet sometimes on sports events, but never more than a few dollars. And only with friends, people he knew. Oh, he fancied himself an expert on American football. Uh, Mrs. Heinrich, in the few days before he was shot, was, was his behavior any different? How do you mean? Or did he seem in any way upset? Or... What do you mean? Did he act as if he expected to be killed? Oh, no, Lieutenant. He never expressed any fears or doubts to you about his safety? No, why should he? Thomas lived an open, honest life. He worked hard. He had nothing to fear. Uh, do the names Hans Schulman, Henry Blotz, or Gregor Spasinski mean anything to you? Hmm. They do not sound familiar. Why? Uh, those are the other three men who have been murdered. Oh, yeah. We read about them in the papers. No, Thomas did not know them. Hmm. Uh, are you aware that your husband was uh, arrested once? He was? Yeah, he got into a fight in a bar. Oh, that. Yes, I remember. But that was years ago. Well, we have to follow all leads, Mrs. Heinrich. Did he ever tell you what the quarrel was about? Yeah. It was because of a disagreement about a football game. He still did not know the rules so well, then. I see. Oh, uh, well, I think that's all we have to ask you. Oh, must you go? Wouldn't you like to stay for some coffee? It would be no Mrs. problem. Mrs. Heinrich, uh, let me ask you one more question. Huh? Do you think that your husband was deliberately murdered for a reason or shot down at random? A friend of Thomas once said he had a genius for living an ordinary life. He read the newspaper and never held a crutch. His ambitions were modest and he knew how to be happy. Now, why should anyone want to kill such a man? I don't know, Mrs. Heinrich. That's what we hope to find out. Good day. Good day, Captain. Thank you for coming to see me. Well, still nothing. Yeah. Nothing concrete to go on. Let's go. Just a minute, Tony. Something's trying to click. What? Did you notice... Did you notice the way she looked at me? And when you introduced me, her, her eyes dropped to my nameplate. For just a split second, a, a, a look came into her eyes. Yeah? I've seen that look before, Tony... I was a small kid in Europe. What look? What are you getting at? My name. My name, Tony. Bernstein. Oh, since when did you become so sensitive? I don't care what she thinks of me, Tony. That's not the point. The point is Europe. What do you mean? The link that we're looking for. We've only gone into the murdered man's backgrounds in this country, but what if they knew each other before? Yeah, there's a whole possibility we've been overlooking. Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing? A couple more questions for Mrs. Heinrich. Oh, you are still here. Uh, Mrs. Heinrich, what nationality are you and your husband? Why, American. But uh, before you came to this country? German. Mm. Uh, and, and what business was your husband in? He had his own paint store. And before you immigrated? Before? Why, I'm not sure... I think we worked for a factory. You don't know? We didn't meet until 1946, just a few months before we sailed for America. Excuse me, Mrs. Heinrich, but that's not true. Your records from the Department of Immigration indicate that you were married in 1941. Yeah, we were. Okay, I'll ask you again. What did your husband do? He was... In the German army. But he never was an officer, just a sergeant, a common soldier. I'm sorry I lied, but it is a habit. Such feelings can still be aroused, even after all these years. That it's easier this way. Where was he stationed? The Eastern Front, Russia. It was horrible. Thomas never believed we would win. Thank you, Mrs. Heinrich. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, Florence couldn't leave the front desk, Lieutenant. 
She asked me to bring you the files on those four murdered men. Oh, thanks, Peter. Oh, Peter, would you stop by my office tomorrow morning before work? I've got to speak to you about something. Oh, certainly, Captain. Thanks. Mike, I've got those files memorized, and I can tell you right now that you're not going to find anything that matches. Heinrich and Schulman were German, okay? Blotz was Romanian, and Vesinski was Czechoslovakian. And look, they immigrated as early as 1946 and as late as 1962. But all after the war. I think it's a lead worth following up, Tony. I'd like to contact Interpol headquarters in Paris and see if they can come up with more information on these men. Go ahead, but don't hold your breath. If these four had anything in their past they didn't want known, they'd probably change their names long before they left Europe. A lot of people did that. I know. If my hunch is correct, these men didn't. And that's why they're dead. Millions of people have come to this country in search of a new life. Most have found it. And in the process have left their old lives behind forever. Now today, we're hearing a great deal of talk about people who would like to go back and rediscover their roots. Would our four murder victims have been amongst those people, or would they have preferred the earlier chapters of their lives to have remained a closed book? I shall return shortly with Act Two. We all know a guy who only occasionally shaves for big occasions, and it's because that occasional shave really hurts. It's the time of year for big occasions, and yet there he is, suffering with that cheap drugstore razor. Let's help him out. Henson Shaving's line of razors, built with aerospace precision, deliver a smooth shave your dad, brother, and even son can enjoy, eventually. With replacement blades just 10 cents each, you'll buy it once, and they'll use it for life. How's that for the perfect gift? Celebrate with 100 free blades on your first purchase, and no subscription headaches. HensonShaving.com slash holiday. Four unsolved murders. Four men who apparently did not know each other, who apparently had nothing in common except the manner in which they died, all killed by bullets from the same gun. But was there another link between them, a link somewhere in their past? And more importantly, will such a link, if it exists, lead the police to the murderer before he strikes again? Oh, Mike. Oh, hi, Florence. There's a rather large envelope here that's got your name on it. Oh, thanks. Mm. Hey, it's from Interpol. Gee, that was quick. I only made the request four days ago. What else in there? Oh, four complete dossiers on the four men who were murdered. Mm. And every one of them contains photostatic copies of old records. Uh, hey, I think I found what I'm looking for, Florence. Is, uh, is the captain back from lunch yet? He's in his office. Tony, we've got our answer from Interpol already. And I think I found the connection we've been looking for. It seems Maria Heinrich didn't quite tell us the whole truth. Her husband was in uniform, all right, but not in the regular German army. He was a member of the Schutzstaffel. What's that? Hitler's elite guard, otherwise known as the SS. But more than that, he was, a, he was in a branch of the SS known as the Death's Head Battalion. Or didn't they have something to do with the concentration camps? Yeah, they ran them. Ah, so that's what Thomas Heinrich, the genius at ordinary living, had in his past. Uh, what about the others? That's it. That's the link. It's the same story on every one of them. It's all here in these dossiers. All were in the SS, and all were guards at concentration camps. And 30 years later, someone's caught up with them. Well, huh? that's the way it looks. Well, it could be just a coincidence. Or it could be the first real lead we've had. All right, let's go with this assumption for just a moment. Right away, it raises questions. How so? Well, look here. In the first place, no two of the dead men served in the same camp. Heinrich was at Treblinka in Poland, Blotz was at Dumanovka in Romania, Basinski was at Dachau, and Schulman was stationed at a labor camp in France. Yeah, but people were transferred from one camp to another. Yeah, but four times? Yeah. 
Yeah, very few would have survived that long. So, it's unlikely the murderer would have known his four victims personally. Well, he could be working for a larger organization, perhaps. But that brings up another problem. All the Nazi hunting outfits we know about only go after high-ranking fugitives, the men who were behind the whole machine. Heinrich and the rest, they were all common soldiers. According to these dossiers, none of them attained any rank higher than sergeant. But there would almost have to be an organization behind this, Tony. I mean, how else could you get this kind of information on people? Look at the resources you need, the hours of research, the amount of traveling, the, the, the credentials to gain access to confiscated Nazi files. No one person could do all that by himself. So, either we've stumbled onto a new organization whose very existence hasn't even been known until now, or one of the older groups is broadening its sights. There's a big difference between hunting down a handful of top Nazis and going wholesale after the hundreds of rank and file. Yeah, well, they were all part of it, weren't they? Yeah, I suppose they were. Well, even if we are on the right track, none of this helps us answer the question, where do we go from here? Who do we protect? No one's going to admit that he was a member of the SS, and asking Interpol to research the background of every person who's immigrated here since the war is hopeless. Yeah, 30 years later. And now the hunters are the hunted. Mike, how do you feel about this? What? Well, what do you mean? Well, you do agree, don't you, that these killings have to be stopped? Tony, what are you trying to say? Mike, I know you lost your mother and most of your family in those camps. If you feel that you can't pursue this case in good conscience... I'm a police officer, Tony. That's my job. Hey, afternoon, Lieutenant Bernstein. Uh, oh, hi, Peter. Do you mind if I go ahead with my cleaning up? No, 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 go ahead. Is, uh, something the matter? You're usually gone by now. Uh, it looks like we've come onto our first real lead uh, on those murders. Well, isn't that good? Well, if our assumption is correct, there's a there's a part of me that isn't sorry those men are dead. Does it surprise you to have such feelings? I was brought up to respect the law, Peter, religious and secular. And now you're afraid, huh? Afraid? Well, but inside the man you've been taught to believe you are. There lingers the shadow of a primitive ancestor. Yeah. The one who set an eye for an eye. And... Well, there are always two possibilities to everything, aren't there? Maybe. But I don't see how it helps. Well, the, the lead you've discovered, either it's correct or it's incorrect, right? Right. Now, if it's incorrect, you've nothing to worry about. And if it's correct? You have no way of knowing that for certain until you caught your criminal, right? Right. So why worry about it now? <laughs> You know, Peter, I had a great-grandfather who reasoned the way you do. Well, you see, it helped him to live to be a great-grandfather. Uh, he died in a concentration camp. His reasoning did him no good there. Ah, uh, how do you know? The mind is a wonderful thing. It can lift us out of the heaviest chains. Of course, a mind can also be unbelievably stupid and decide quite arbitrarily that a person is unfit to work. Because of his age. What? Oh, that talk I had with Captain Nolan this morning. Apparently there's a new law that makes it mandatory for certain state employees to retire at 65. Oh, gee, I'm sorry to hear well, that. I told the captain the law didn't apply to me. I'm not 65. I said I'm 73. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the silliest thing is, if you apply that law to the judge who upheld it, he'd have to retire too. Yeah. Well, there must be other things you could do, Peter. You're obviously an educated man. Oh, in my native Holland, I was a doctor of jurisprudence. But when it came to this country, I was too old and too lazy to set about learning a whole new legal code. Yeah. Well, this job means a lot to you, doesn't it? When you leave here at night, you go home, don't you? But I have no home to go to. Just a hotel room I rent for the month. Hey, I never knew that, Peter. Oh, it's not so bad. See, I've come to consider the police station like a home. The various rooms are like parts of a house, and you and the others, well, you... <laughs> they're just like my family. You don't have any family of your own? No, they're, uh, they're back in the old country. Well, don't you keep in touch with them? Uh, if you'll excuse me, Lieutenant, I... I'd better get on with my work. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm sorry, Peter. I, I didn't mean to pry. Oh, that's all right. Yes. It's late. I, I should be getting... Uh, I should be going, too. Uh, 
can I fear? Hello. Tony. Tony, it's Mike. I have to see you right away. Mike? But it's 4.30 in the morning. Where are you? I'm at uh, Kermit's Diner on, on Parsons Boulevard. Are you all right? What's happened? Well, just meet me here as soon as you can, okay? Tony, I haven't been able to sleep all night. All right, Mike. Now, what's up? Huh? How was is, how is Interpol able to respond so quickly, huh? What? But on Monday, I telex to them the names of four men and ask them to develop whatever information they could. That's a process that should have taken two weeks minimum. And yet we heard back from them within four days. Now, why? So they're efficient. You woke me up for that? But don't you see what I'm getting at? I think there's only one way they could have responded that fast if they already had dossiers on those four men in their file. And if that is so, there must be a reason why Interpol has dossiers on them. And someone at Interpol headquarters must know what that reason is. All right, it's now 5 a.m. Yeah, don't remind me. That means it's noontime in Paris. Now, if we get a wire off now, we should have a response later today. Uh, Mike, you don't have to prove anything to me. What do you mean? We're after a killer, aren't we? So what if the men he's killing were the cogs in the machine that destroyed six million people? He still has to be stopped. Now, that's the law. That's our job. Mike, calm down, huh? I know, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike. My, my mind's been on fire all night. I feel like I'm racing with myself. Uh, yeah, you know, there's part of me that just, just wants to sit back and, and wait until the murderer strikes again so we can double-check our theory. Mike. Go by the station and send the wire to Interpol. And then go lie down on the couch in my office and try to get some sleep. This case, Mike, well, it could go on for a long time. Don't let it get to you. Anything yet, Forrest? Oh, relax, Mike. Look, it could be hours before you get a response from Paris. I'll wait, I'll wait. What time did you send the wire? 6 a.m.? You look like you haven't gotten any sleep at all. Now, why don't you go back into Captain Nolan's office and try to rest? Hmm? Hey, look. Hmm? Look, something's coming in over, over the telex. What, what, what is that? This is what you've been waiting for. Well, what does it say? Major Bakke, Interpol officer, flying to San Francisco for international conference on crime. Now, what? Just, just a minute, there's more. He'll be laying over for two hours at O'Hare Airport, and you'll have the information with him that you requested. Does it say when he's coming mm -hmm. through? October 14th. Hey, that's tomorrow. At what time? 2 p.m. Here's the flight information. Uh, thanks, Flo. Oh, uh, one, one other thing. Uh, uh, get me the number of the Records Bureau at the U.S. Department of Immigration, will you? There's, there's something else I want to check out as well. Lieutenant Bernstein? Yes, uh, Major Barkey. How do you do? I'm sorry my flight was late. Yeah, I appreciate your cooperation, Major. Uh, shall, we, uh, shall we have a seat over there? <laughs> if it is all the same to you, I prefer to stay on my feet. I have been sitting on a plane for eight hours. <laughs> of course. Uh, the information you desire does not come from my department, but I have been briefed, and I hope I can answer all your questions. Now, you wish to know about certain Interpol dossier? Yes, I do, uh... Uh, tell me, did they exist prior to our department's request for them? Ah, yes, they did. Uh -huh. and, 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 and why? Why? Oh, that is very simple. Because we had already been asked to investigate these men some months before. Uh, but, in fact, we were asked for information on many more men on just these four. You were? Yeah. I have uh, brought a copy of the list with me. Uh, ah, here it is. Oh, thanks. Uh, why are some of these names crossed out? Uh, those are the persons we could not trace, for whom no records could be found. In the war, Lieutenant, many things were lost. Yeah. Um, why, why do some of these names have another name beside them? Ah, some of these people changed not only their country, but their identity. And how were you able to trace them? Their fingerprints. Uh -huh. The original request was accompanied by certain information on the persons, including their fingerprints. Yes, of course. That's why only people who'd been arrested have been killed. Uh, pardon? Uh, the person who requested these investigations. Uh, uh, do you have his name? I, I, I should have the order here somewhere. Uh, 
Did you say these men are being killed? Yeah, four of them are now dead. So the others, they are in danger too. Possibly. I see. And you think that the person who made the request that... Ah, uh, here's the order. Why? This is most strange. What? The person who asked for the investigations, he's from your own police department. What's his name? Nodan. Captain Tony Nodan. A policeman's lot is not a happy one, opined Gilbert and Sullivan. That is surely true for Lieutenant Mike Bernstein at this moment. The long and winding search for a murderer has taken him across 8,000 miles of continent and ocean, back through 30 years in time, and led him right into the office of the man with whom he works. I shall return in a moment with our final act. Circumstantial evidence is a curious thing. It can point overwhelmingly to a certain conclusion, yet, by definition, circumstantial evidence is always incomplete. It offers no smoking gun. And mystery fans know that many a story turns on the old adage, things are often not as they seem. The only problem is, just as often, things are exactly as they seem. So, which is it to be in our story? Well, that would seem to turn on what Lieutenant Bernstein decides to do next. But unfortunately, we won't find out just yet what that is. For when he returns to the police station, another shock awaits him. Mike? Hi, Florence. Is the captain in? He's waiting for you. Thanks. Well, was your trip to the airport successful? Yeah, I missed the rush hour traffic. Oh? The fellow from Interpol wasn't any help, huh? He gave me some information that's wrong. That has to be wrong. Well, I hope you don't mind the drive because you're going back out to the airport in the morning. Oh, no. What for? You remember that officer's exchange program you applied for several months ago? Well, it's come through. Exchange program? You're going to New York City for six months. Now, I, I, I'm in the middle of a case. I can't go now. Who's, whose idea was this? Yours. No, 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 no. no. Florence. <laughs> Now, this, this timing is just a little too neat. It's too convenient. Mike, it's an honor to be selected for this program. Someone must have pulled some strings. Well, I'm just the desk sergeant on the day shift. Yeah. What, was, it, was it Tony, Forrest? What? what? Was it Captain Nolan? I mean, is he behind this? Oh, Mike, no matter how it came about, you know you deserve it. Is he? Well, just between us, Mike. I think the captain did make a few calls on your behalf. He knows how much you wanted it. I'll bet. Thanks, Flo. Oh, Mike, wait a minute. Something came for you while you were out. Oh, uh, what? A wire from the Department of Immigration. Oh, thanks. Well, aren't you going to open it? Later. I have a couple of things to discuss with the captain first. Tony? Oh, Mike, how is your... Why am I being sent to New York? What? Florence says I'm going to New York tomorrow. Oh, yeah, Congratulations. It's that exchange program you applied yeah, for. Yeah, I know what it is, Tony. What I want to know is why now? Well, you've been on the waiting list for months. Why are you trying to get rid of me? What? Florence says you made some calls. Now, is that right? Well, yes. Why? Why, Tony? Okay, Mike, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm wrong, but I had to use my best judgment. What are you talking about? Have you looked at yourself in the mirror today? Don't change the subject. I'm not. Mike, you are a mess. You're unshaven. You look like you haven't slept. And... I haven't. All right, then. That's my point. Your wife called me today to find out if I knew what was happening to you. Well, what did you tell her? That this case is putting too much stress on you. That's not true. Isn't it? Ever since we discovered the truth about those murder victims, you've been half crazy. Tony, am I doing my job or not? Mike, you are trying too hard. And sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. I am a police officer. I am trained... And I am in control of myself. You also lost your entire family except for your father in the concentration camps. Oh, 
Oh, Mike, I'm sorry, but I really don't want to watch you going through this. Your orders are being completed for the exchange program. You and Betty will leave as soon as all the arrangements are settled. Now, what about your meeting with Major Bakker? Did you find him? Yeah. Well, what were you able to learn? Nothing. <laughs> evening, Lieutenant. Oh, evening, Peter. Oh, uh, my... Why are you cleaning out your locker? It isn't Friday already, is it? No, I'm being sent to New York on an offices exchange program. Oh, well... Oh, I see. I'd like to say congratulations, but I... I can tell by the tone in your voice that's not what you want to hear. Look, we're sitting on top of four unsolved murders, Peter. It isn't the best timing in the world. Well, you know what they say about bureaucracies. They were invented by people who had nothing better to do than to frustrate those who did, eh? <laughs> uh, how long will he be gone? Uh, about six months. Six months, huh? Well, then, I guess we'd better say goodbye. What? Goodbye. See, uh, I'll be retired by the time you return. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll miss you, Peter. I, uh, I've enjoyed our talks. <laughs> I enjoyed them, too. Sorry you had to put up with so much from an old man. Uh, Peter, um, uh, do you have a minute? Sure, sure. All the time in the world. The dust will wait. Now, Peter, suppose I had proof on a guy that he was guilty of a crime I was convinced he hadn't committed. Well, and I'd say that either there's something wrong with your proof or you're a, you're a bad judge of human nature. But I have the evidence. I got it in black and white. But you don't believe. I don't know. I was, I was convinced of his innocence. That is, until I talked to him. Well, you, 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 you confronted him. Mm, no. Well, maybe you should. That might be your answer. He'd never confess. He may not be guilty. Well, how could I be sure? Well, now, is, uh, is this person a, a friend? Yeah. Close friend? Yeah. Then it seems you must confront him. Otherwise, for sure, the only thing you'll ever be certain of are your suspicions. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Oh, that's all right. Oh, you dropped something on the What? Oh, yeah. Oh, that telegram Florence handed me. I'd almost forgotten about it. What is it? More bad news? I'm afraid so. It's a wire that confirms something I'd almost forgotten about. You're right, Peter. A direct confrontation is going to be the only way to deal with this. Oh, my. I'm glad I caught you before you left. Are you? Now, look... You're going to be gone for six months. We aren't going to see each other. And I don't want you leaving under a cloud. Who says I'm under a cloud? Uh, <clears throat> perhaps uh, I ought to go clean up some... Uh, no, Peter. No, I, I want you to stay. I'll need a witness. A witness for what? Why are you getting rid of me, Tony? What? What's the real reason? Well, I've explained... No, to... Tony, I don't think you have. What are you getting at? You want me out of the way because I'm getting too close to the truth. Which is? Which is that you killed Heinrich and the others. What? Major Bakke gave me the whole story. Now, you sent a list of names to Interpol and asked for investigations into their pasts. The four slain men all appear on that list. I sent a list? Well, this is crazy. Is it? Now, here are some photo stats the Major left with me. And there's the list, and there's a copy of the order with your name on it. Mike. Mike, I swear to you, I don't know anything about this. Well, that's not a very viable defense. I didn't even know those men. Why would I want to kill them? Yeah, that's what a jury is going to want to know, Tony. I'm arresting you for the murders of Thomas Heinrich, Hans Schulman, Henry Blotz, and Gregor Bezinski. Oh, Mike, come off. I've had my eye on you for a long time, well, Tony. Why? you got a gun collection at home, don't you? You know I do. You've seen it. And in that collection, you got a semi-automatic like the one used in the killings. No, I don't. A Croydon Spitz 38. You weren't very smart to use it, Tony. There's not many of those around anymore. What are you talking about? You thought you could get me off your back, didn't you? 
Well, I got an airtight case that's going to send you to the chair for the murders of four men. Lieutenant. Lieutenant. You're making a mistake. I don't think so, Peter. I know exactly what I'm doing. Captain Nolan didn't kill those men. I did. I know. I know you did, Peter. You... You killed those men, Peter? Yes, Captain. How did you know, Lieutenant? Well, you told me yourself. You said if I was certain my friend was innocent, then there must be something wrong with my evidence. If Tony didn't send that list to Interpol, then it had to be someone with access to Tony's identity, his badge number, and the police department telex code. Hey, let me take a look at that list. They're all from our files. I first began to suspect Peter yesterday when he was reluctant to talk about his family. I called the Records Bureau of the Immigration Department in Washington. This telegram here is their response. What does it say? It says they have no record of a Peter Fleming who immigrated from Holland. What's your real name? <laughs> Obradovich. Piotr Obradovich. I am from Poland. And your family? My family? <laughs> Lost in the camps during the war. My wife, my four children, my mother and father... You and my brothers. And uh, you were the only survivor? Hmm? Yes. But, Peter, the men you killed weren't responsible. They were from the very lowest echelons of the SS. The camps couldn't have been run without them, could they, Captain? Every person is responsible for his actions. Taking orders can be as much a crime as giving them. My... What was all this nonsense about my owning a gun like the murder weapon? I knew Peter would never just confess. But I didn't think he'd be able to stand by in silence while an innocent person was accused of his crime. I was right, Peter. Your sense of justice did run deeper than your thirst for revenge. The four men I killed lived for 30 years under the delusion that they had escaped all culpability for their crimes. And I disabused them of their delusions of reprieve. I have no right to expect to escape the same fate myself. Past lives half erased in the smoky tumult of war. The innocent are slain, the guilty live on. The temptation for retribution is strong within us. And indeed, no person ought to be allowed to go free from his crimes. But in Peter's case, the men he killed will not return his family to him. He would have done better to heed Longfellow's dictum. Let the past bury its dead. I shall return in a moment with a final word. live more than one life during our time on earth. Conversions can change the man into a beast and the beast into a man. But we are wrong to lay the praise or blame at the doorstep of circumstance. For each of us carries within himself the whole range of possibilities of the race. And therefore we must, as Pyotr Obradovich said, assume the responsibility for our own actions. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Norman Rose, Evie Juster, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
all know a guy who only occasionally shaves for big occasions, and it's because that occasional shave really hurts. It's the time of year for big occasions, and yet there he is, suffering with that cheap drugstore razor. Let's help him out. Henson Shaving's line of razors, built with aerospace precision, deliver a smooth shave your dad, brother, and even son can enjoy, eventually. With replacement blades just 10 cents each, you'll buy it once, and they'll use it for life. How's that for the perfect gift? Celebrate with 100 free blades on your first purchase, and no subscription headaches. HensonShaving.com slash holiday. Shop the Plato's Closet Black Friday event in North Charleston and West Ashley and let the deals begin. You know Plato's Closet always has a huge selection of trendy recycled styles at amazing prices, but Black Friday deals are different. They're better. We've been holding back some of our best inventory, and you won't want to miss our Black Friday event. Save on gently used styles from Patagonia, Lululemon, Lily Pulitzer, and hundreds of popular brands. Plato's Closet is ready to let the Black Friday deals begin. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue.